Looks like we are live Monday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. And this morning we're going to be talking about the emerging threat to our supply chain. And you don't have to go far to see right well that we have a problem with the supply chain. We sure do, brother. You can see it everywhere. And while we're waiting for folks to jump on this Emerging Threats Monday, again, this is a reboot of Emerging Threats Monday. If you're just joining me, my name is Rich Brown, the co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show America's leading self-defense podcast. And uh, I'm joined by Will Wood. Will, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. My name's Will, um, airline pilot, general news and uh, economics geek. I've uh, been following this stuff, oh gosh, going back to the Bill Clinton days when I was, when I was a much younger man, so to speak. And uh, just really enjoyed doing this research and uh, looking forward to talking about more stuff with you this morning. Cool. And let's see here. We got five folks jumping on already. Please let me know who you are, where you are coming at us from this morning. And if you don't mind hitting that share button, we'd really appreciate it. Let's talk about our sponsors, Will. We got Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. The Bob XL is the body opponent bag. XL because it's extra long so you can work on your uh, common peroneal strikes. That's those outside the thigh strikes that hurt so bad. And recently, just talking about that, there was a... MMA fighter that won his fight, but he had been kicked in the thigh so much they almost had to amputate. It was pretty gruesome. Wow. Literally, the muscle, they had to cut his leg open and do some stuff to the muscle. He'll never be the same again. So if you want to have that kind of debilitating effect on your adversaries, you pick yourself up with Century Martial Arts, Bob XL. All of our amazing sponsors are going to be in today's show notes links, and you can get deep discounts for just, just for watching the show and be a loyal follower of what Mike C. Clinton and I are doing. APPHemp.com, that's AppalachianStandard.com. Jesse and I were in the Marines together. Him and his family are makers of the finest CBD products money can buy. A couple drips underneath your tongue before you go to bed at night. You'll sleep better. You'll perform better. Cognitively, you'll function better. You'll thank me for it later. We also have the Cool Fire Trainer. Cool Fire Trainer, man, you don't need to dry fire anymore. That's old school. That's 19th century, right, Will? We're, Absolutely. we're, cool. we're cool firing now, okay? Yeah. But you're going to have to we're, wait. We're cool guys, that's why. <laughs> We're cool guys and we're cool firing. But yeah, you're going to have to wait a couple months before you get your cool fire. But what it does is it's, it's a, you load your barrel with CO2 and then it gives you felt recoil. It's your gun, your sights, your trigger. I love the shot indicating resetting trigger, the CERT trigger. I'll be uh, the CERT uh, uh, firearms training tool. I'll be using it next week uh, at a training class I'm attending or actually teaching. But it doesn't do what the Cool Fire does. The Cool Fire gives you felt recoil with your gun. So check out the Cool Fire trainer and also check out the discount code. Mountain Man Medical is another amazing sponsor of ours. We finally have the co-branded trauma kit. It's in my truck right now. or I should have it here on the desk so I can show you guys what it does. Mike Seekler and I are going to make a video going through the ingredients of it very soon. We've got dates for filming that content coming up. So please stay tuned for that. But you can get a deep discount from Mountain Man Medical just by watching today's show. Last but not least, Precision Holsters. I'm wearing my Precision Holsters belt this morning, Will. Awesome. As well as my Ultra Appendix rig. Competition line, I'll be shooting the Tennessee State ne uh, next next April, I think it is. Yeah, 2022. And I'll be using my competition line from Precision Holsters. So thanks for all of our amazing sponsors. Thank you to the 12 folks on. Will, do you want to welcome some people on here this morning? Yeah, let's see who we got here. We got... Uh... I see uh, Jesse Perez there, coin 2221. What, what, what are you up to with coin numbers now, Rich? Uh, uh, going on to almost 3,000. Oh, awesome. Um, my, my number's feeling lower and lower all the time at 426. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see who else. We got Alan Kelly there, uh, your brother, Jeff Brown. And good morning from uh, Tri-County Gun Sales from Ken... Brett Vogel. Palm Beach, Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, and Gordon is on. Good morning, Gordon. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you to the 14 folks that are joining us here on, a, on another Monday edition of Emerging Threats Money. And today we're going to talk about supply chain. And Will, do you want to, is there any way we can sum up why are two self-defense oriented guys talking about all these macroeconomic issues? Well, you know, the, the macro shapes everything else we do. Um, you know, if let's say at the start of the pandemic, a couple of prepper guys had a whole bunch of, you know, 
drive, you know, freeze dried food and stuff like that, but you didn't have any toilet paper stored up, that was a problem. So by, by, and then even as a bigger picture, watching this macro stuff, uh, in, in the years of following the stuff, I, it's almost like you can have a crystal ball. You, know, you can't, you can't get down into the, into the gory details, right? But you can go, okay, there's going to be some problems here. And we're going to dig into some of that today at the, at the very end, some, some other supply chain stuff that's, uh, already cropping up out there and it's making little news blurbs, but it's not, it, it, if it ever hits the news, it, whoever's just learning about then is going to be way behind the curve. Yeah. And that goes to, you know, COVID, uh, you and I were watching COVID, uh, I think like early last February, cause I'd come back yep. from Europe in January and I was hearing about it over there and I wasn't hearing about it here in the States. And I was, uh, I think you and I were talking, Mike Seaclin and I were talking, I'm like, man, this is going to be bad. Yeah. <clears throat> of course, here we are. We're still, what is it, 18 months to flatten the curve? Yeah. The, you know, the hardest part of the 14 day lockdown is the first 18 months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Will Parker is on. Says, Sorry, brothers. I'm in Atlanta for an instructor development course. Uh, at, Will, I will see you next week in New Jersey, brother. Uh, be safe. Looking forward to training with you. Please like and hit that share button, guys. Will, where do we even start with something like this? Well, the, of course, the, we know the biggest problem with the supply chain is the cool fire trainer. Because oh, yeah. being two months out and not getting your dry fire in, you know, have the dry fire because you can't cool fire. I mean, that's it. That's I, think that's pretty much, I think that's pretty much the show right there. <laughs> we can shut it down right now. Yeah, and we I can. <laughs> so, the, you know, the, looking back on it, just doing some, some general reading on it, I, I think this all started um, back in the 90s. Um, that's when we started going to, at the time, the Japanese were doing the just-in-time in inventory stuff. And, you know, I'll tell you, as a, as a business owner, inventory is expensive. Yeah. You know, you're sitting there, your money's invested, and it takes, you know, let's just say, you, you know, you're keeping a 30-day inventory out there. That That's a lot of cash to tie up uh, when that money could be invested into marketing, growing your business, or just an S&P 500 fund. It's it's money lost. So the tighter you can make that, that uh, inventory control, it saves a lot of money. And so that's when we started in with the just in time. But then when, when the PCs really hit um, mid to late nineties, that let them tighten everything up. Um, Walmart is the, the champion of this by far. Remember way back, I watched a, a special on Walmart's inventory control because I'm, I'm a geek like that. And they had it down to if there's a hurricane, they knew how many strawberry pop tarts to order. I saw that, yeah, because I it's that. that's it's comfort food and it'll yeah. keep the kids happy and it, it, it keep me happy too. I like strawberry pop tarts, so they had it down to know exactly how many cases to buy for each Walmart in Florida if there's a hurricane. That's incredible, it is incredible. And uh, on a completely side note, I wonder if it once you start sending them and people start consuming them, if you create, you know, you start creating your own uh thing yeah they would have they would have loved chocolate but you didn't send chocolate you sent strawberry because that's what the initial data said people wanted yeah oh yeah for sure um and you know it just you know humans are funny animals right so we we, we get into our habit patterns with with stuff like that and then the next big step with all the supply chain stuff was when when china got opened up now that started in was it, i think it was 72 with nixon mm -hmm. somewhere in there when he first did the, the visit over there, but really not much happened until China joined the WTO. And then that's when, when things really started going. Um, historically, labor, um, um, sorry, business always flows to the cheapest source of labor. That was China. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there was, you know, a lot of cheap labor over there. Uh, oddly enough, right now, it's actually cycling towards India. Um, but that'll be in the next, say, five to seven years. You got 1.3 billion people over there, and how many of them have a job? You know, yeah, um, not enough. Not enough. Uh, so they're 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 going to keep cycling over there, and that's uh, when you when you see China. Same going back to your microchip talk with China's actions towards Taiwan right now, which ties in with this supply chain thing, of course. Um, but we're going to start seeing that with India as well. They're going to rattle the sabers because China sees India's direct competition for those, uh, for those dollars for their exports. Um, good. But the thing about, you know, uh, I'm trying to be Sally segue here. The <laughs> thing about 
when you have cheap labor overseas, that's all mm -hmm. well and good, but then you have to get those products back here to the U S to be consumed. Right. And that's sure hence the problem that we're going to discuss today. Yeah. And the, and it ties into your, um, um, trade deficit you talked about last week as well. Uh, so that brings us up basic real, we just covered 40 years real fast. I'm sure it only felt like 22 years. Um, so now that brings us up to <clears throat> modern day. Um, in 2020, uh, there was 275 million tons of container stuff shipped in container ships. Um, and that's an increase from 26 million tons historically, like back in 1990. That's a so huge increase. So 26 million tons in 1990, mm -hmm. 275 million in 2020. Yeah. That's yeah. insane, man. It's it's crazy. And and you know, things were running running pretty good until this COVID stuff. Uh, I mean, we got it, we ordered our, our stuff and it showed up, right? So yeah, but to your point though, like uh, I, I have a green belt in Lean Six Sigma, mm -hmm. and I can tell you, you know, all the exercises we did getting our certifications, you know, you want to reduce that, that waste in the production chain. You want to get the smallest amount of what they call whip or work in production. That's what they called it when I got my okay. uh, certification. I don't know if they still call it that, but, but like you said, Will, and I think this bears repeating the supply, there's no slack in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. You probably heard economists saying that. And what they're saying is there's no warehouses just filled with goods. Right. We don't do that because we waste money doing that. So mm -hmm. it has to get here on a ship. And like you said, up until COVID hit, everything was humming along just fine. But yep. any little ripple in the supply chain can have a disastrous, long-reaching effects, as we saw last week mm -hmm. with our chips. But now yep. it's really everything, right? Oh, it's it's it is it's everything. I mean, it, it's hard to name something that doesn't go somewhere on a ship. Um, and and we're going to get into it, but it it even rolls both ways. It's it's the the lack of capability in the ports is affecting our ability to export things out of this country too. I, there was an, uh, just real quick. There was an old man come up to me one time we were in Lowe's and he was looking around this old timer was, and he's looking and he looks at me and he looks me up and down and he goes, ain't there anything in here made in America anymore? I said, just me and you old timer just me <laughs> and you. Yep. Yep. And that, that, that's, that's a fact. Yeah. And it's, it, and it's, uh, I'm hoping this is the turning point. I mean, we saw it with like PPE, medical stuff. Um, I'm, I'm hoping this is the turning point to it. Yeah. So, um, so the current situation is what, Will? Where are we at? So, um, so right now, 90% of non-bulk cargo, bulk cargo would be your iron ores, your, where they just dump it into the ship. I think more of a barge when I do that because I grew up on the Mississippi River. Um, so 90% of everything that isn't bulk cargo is shipped via container ships. So very little via aircraft. Um, I looked last night. Uh, the number is actually down a little bit, which is hopeful. Uh, we're down to 52 ships parked off the Long Beach port waiting to dock. So How many right now, say that number again? 5-2, 52. Whoa. 52. Now, in the past, um, I, I find this amazing from a logistics standpoint. In the past, uh, a ship that left China would would have a 12 hour window. They would, they would be scheduled to hit at the port, which I think is pretty incredible. You know, we're talking about weeks to get across. Right. Mm -hmm. But even if they miss that window, they might wait a day to, to get a birthing spot and unload. So right now they're running about four weeks. They're sitting out there. Four weeks, four weeks. Unbelievable. And those yeah. crews have to be fed. Somebody's got to pay them. Mm -hmm. you know, I want to talk, let me address something yeah. that uh, Dr. Gordon Bodson, who's on this morning, he says, quote, there is no lipid fat uh, for IV nutritional formulas in our hospitals. And uh, Dr. John Adeen is on also this morning. I don't know if he's seeing some of the supply chain issues in his hospitals as well. But but again, the, these are the precise reasons that we that uh, Will and I want to discuss some macroeconomic trends with you. And Tony just says, I bought a new pair of Georgia boots made in the Dominican Republic. But anyway, so 52 yeah. cargo ships waiting off the coast Yep. as as of what, yesterday or? As of, I checked last night about 7.30. Okay. 
So, oh, um, yeah, so it's, I mean, they're sitting out there four weeks and, and those, those logistics and, and those, those folks working on those boats, I, you know, you just spend a couple of weeks on the ocean and you can see the coast. And you want to get off the boat and do something and you just got to sit there for another month. It's, it's crazy. Um, so then it comes out, okay, why, why is this backed up like this? And it's the, the ports have put in pretty draconian COVID restrictions on the workers there. So that, that started this whole path going down there. Um, and then it, it flowed into the trucking industry as well. Um, uh, looking at my notes here, uh, the LA ports, which would be Long Beach and Los Angeles, Long Beach actually being the larger of the two, uh, unloaded 4.9 million containers in 2020. So that includes the time during the shutdown. Now, you know, as we got deeper into the spring, people were ordering a lot of stuff, but early on, no, nobody was ordering anything. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Um, I see Alan here brings up the truck driver shortage. We're going to, we're going to push into that a little bit here as well. Good, good. Uh, later on. Um, uh, the other limiting factor that we're coming across, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've read around where guys would buy in the past shipping containers and, and bury them or use them for storage out back, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good luck getting one now. Uh, <laughs> they are desperate for those things. Um, they're, I haven't heard of anybody selling them back. I'm, I'm sure there's some regulations about, about that happening in the shipping industry, but they're, they're just, desperate for empty containers over in China. Um, well, can you imagine? Because the, they're, the shipping containers that they normally have in flux are sitting on a cargo ship for four weeks at a time. Or sitting in a port because of logistic problems there in the LA port or, as Alan brought up, trucker shortages. Yeah, and it, that's a great point, Alan. And we'll get to that. Like you said, Rex Carter also says, our local Sam's Club is limiting the purchase of items and raising prices on those items. Another thing that you'll see very, but you got to look close to see it, is something called shrinkflation. Yep. And that's, uh, you know, you buy the same box of cereal, only you didn't notice it, but it went from 32 ounces of, to, to 29. Mm -hmm. And the next it might be 28, 27. That way they don't have to raise the price. Yep. You don't see a price increase. You just see that the size of the goods getting smaller. Yep. And, and that's something that's a really sneaky way of handling it. But if you have a little bit of shrinkflation and then your Sam's Club limiting the per, uh, amount mm -hmm. of things you can purchase, this all are indicators of what we're talking about this morning. Absolutely. And I saw Costco limited uh, toilet paper, paper towels, and water. Uh, here and we go. Yep. I mean, it's, it's it, like we were talking about earlier, you know, you watch this stuff early on. It's, it's like having a crystal ball. Um, so, and then for, from our standpoint, what we're trying to get to people is stock up now. It's, it's relatively cheap uh, with the inflation that we know is coming and the supply chain issues aren't going to get straightened out anytime soon. They're talking maybe middle of next year, assuming there isn't another hiccup somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you to the 21 folks joining us this morning. If you follow a lot of like Ray Dalio and some of the other economists out there that, you know, they'll tell you cash is trash. Mm -hmm. If you can put it into assets right now, you're, you're far better off than trying to hold on to your cash. And some of those assets might be things that we're talking about this morning that are involved in the shipping industry. So yep. take it away. Well, all right. So um, when last week, when you talked about, you know, our, our trade deficit, well, we've got to get goods out of the country to try and level that out a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, so right now, they're so desperate for ships and containers back in China. There's there's stuff scheduled to go on those ships, in those containers, and they're sitting on rail cars on the West Coast, not being loaded. They're sitting. They're, they're leaving with the ships empty because they can make so much more money coming back that it's not worth taking the extra day, day and a half to load those goods on the ship. So to, to put that in perspective, okay, the, so pretty soon I think we're going to start seeing manufacturers mm -hmm. in the Midwest having to, to slow down or shut down because there's nowhere to ship their stuff to. It did, and I may have been asleep if you said it. <laughs> I might have dozed off. But did, <laughs> did you? I remember reading in your notes somewhere that 75% of the container ships leaving are mm -hmm. empty. Have you talked about that already? Yeah, I, I haven't. No, that was actually next up. Jesus. So 
yeah, 75% of them were empty. So I thought of this as a business person. I went, what, why, why would you do that? That makes no sense because you're making no revenue on the way back or very little compared to what you could. Well, as usual, somebody somewhere owns a calculator and, um, the cost of one container from China to LA right now, the average, okay, is $16,000. Okay. Now that's a 20 foot, that's a 20 foot container. Um, if you want it guaranteed on time, that's going to be $25,000. Thank you very much. All right. Put that in perspective before COVID, it was $2,000. Holy cow. Yeah. So, and right now, if you want to ship something to China from, from LA, it's $4,000. So with what they can charge to get those containers back, they're better off leaving a day early, going back to China, loading those containers up at, say, $20,000, $30,000 a piece, and then heading back. They're better off just leaving those goods behind. Yeah. So eventually, that's going to come back to, to, to these manufacturers here in the U.S. when – all, eventually, when all those warehouses and rail rail yards are full up on the West Coast, there's nowhere to send the stuff to. Exactly. And Dr. John Adine, he says uh, there have been shortages of drugs and IV fluids. And of course, I read a statistic last year. I don't know if it's I don't know how the veracity of this, but I'll, I'll state it uh, and with the caution of it may be accurate or not, that 80 percent of the pharmaceutical drugs we consume in America are uh, produced in India and or China. I don't know if that's true, but if it is, I mean, it, it's all fun and games when you can't get toilet paper to wipe your fat rear end here in America. Mm -hmm. But when you can't get drugs to, te to, to keep your son, daughter, or grandma alive, or yourself, that's a, that's a problem. And, and how long, you know, when you have to watch, especially if you have to watch your kids suffer because you can't get medicine, how long before we start seeing some true social unrest? Yeah, and that's going to be the real kind of social unrest where, you know, it ain't going to be a January 6th insurrection yeah. it's going to be mm -hmm. for real the next time yeah yep um i see matt here mentioned that uh, in the fireworks industry the cost of shipping a container has gone from twelve thousand to forty thousand i'm assuming a little higher prices because that'd be hazardous materials um uh, maybe matt can let us know on that um so one of the questions i got is okay why do they keep sending sending ships to la it's obviously backed up I mean, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out, well, there's got to be some other ports around. Well, Seattle's pretty much maxed out. And then I did some, some more research, and there's ports over by New Orleans, Beaumont, Texas, that area. They, and they actually handle by tonnage way more freight than Los Angeles does. Uh, but they're set up for bulk stuff coming down the Mississippi River. Your grains, your iron ore coming down from Minnesota, stuff like that. They're not set up for container ships. Uh, along those same lines, New York Port Authority uh, put out a press release saying that they're they've got slack. They they can they can handle more ships. Well, the problem there is you have to go down through the Panama Canal. A lot of these container ships are way too big to fit through the Panama Canal. And then once they get over there, do they have the infrastructure to handle the extra um, the extra capacity there coming into the port? If they don't have the truck drivers, the rail cars, they don't have all that's coming in close they're just gonna sit out there and wait so it's yeah that, that that's exactly right these, these are not easy problems to solve yeah so i mean there 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 is no easy solution to this other than time and supply and demand so uh, there's there's an old saying in economics the best cure for high prices is high prices um mm -hmm. but as americans we don't want to wait that out you know, we, we want this fixed now and it's, it's not happening now. So, so is, is it just the ports that are causing the problem or something else going on here? No, there's uh there's the, uh, there's, there's the trucker shortage. Uh, that's for real. Uh, I, I can speak to that firsthand with family experience. My, my oldest son is, uh, wants to drive truck for a living. And as soon as he turns 21 and gets a CDL, he's going to have a job. There, there's no two ways. About oh yeah. That. Um, that there's going to need somebody to support me in my retirement. Um, <laughs> well, another thing he sees his dad being a, a commercial airline pilot. I mean, trucker, commercial airline pilot. What's the difference really? Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, I'm just a glorified heavy equipment operator. Um, uh, so 
as we get into the the trucker side of it, uh, used to be they they have truckers that take containers out of the port and then to a staging area where regular trucking companies pick it up and then haul it wherever. Well, used to be the, those truckers could get about 20 loads a day out of the port because these are these are very short distances and things are running good. Uh, they're down to an average of six now because of the logistical issues there with the port and the, the COVID restrictions, um, which honestly, I don't understand. It, it, even if the, 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 the trucker is, you know, still within the quarantine, but well enough to work, of course, we don't want anybody working when they're truly sick. Um, they're sitting in their truck. Some guy in a crane is dropping a container on there. I mean, I'm sure they got to strap it down or secure it somehow, but it's not, there's no interpersonal contact going on there. So I'm not quite sure what's motivating all those restrictions. Um, and to make it worse, sometimes it gets so bad, they're waiting six hours to load one container. Six hours to load six one. Six hours. And the, the highest number I heard was one guy waited nine hours to load a container. Wow. So, you know, it's, it's funny I, with all this math involved here. And I know that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brothers is on this morning. He's a logistician, spent his entire uh, career in this kind of stuff. I, I'm, I'm sure with all these inputs of metrics, some somebody, some high level economist or, or logistician can give us an output number. Mm -hmm. You know, I, because I'm hearing all these metrics floating across to our viewers this morning. And I, and I know that somebody should be putting this together going yet. Yeah, it's going to be 2024 before we get out of this or, or some mm -hmm. version of that. Yeah. And, and I'm sure we'll, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming the numbers we hear all oh, into the first quarter of 22, things will be getting better. Well, first to find better, you mm -hmm. know, for, from four weeks down to three and a half weeks. Well, that's better. Right. But it's not really solved at that point. So I'm, I, I, I'd be willing to bet it's going to be the end of 2022 before things even have a chance to get back to normal. Yeah. Tony says, is any of this crisis manufactured? And so why? You know, I, I, I will say that never attribute to malevolence what can easily be rectified with stupidity, or I forget the exact phrasing on that, but it's yeah. so true. I mean, and it's not stupidity. It was good it was a problem that was bound to happen, whether it was mm -hmm. a hurricane cause it or something else. But think well, of the 23 folks that are still joining us. Go ahead. Will. I was just going to say, you know, I'm sure there were people in the supply chain, supply chain logistics business two, three, five years ago going, Hey guys, that we, we need to build some more infrastructure here. And then, and this is me supposing. Okay. And then I'm sure they went to their boss or some higher up and went, have you ever tried to build anything in California? We, we need to buy more land. That's going to mean eminent domain, right? That's going to, it's going to cost a insane amount of money. And then the 15 years to get through the environmental impact thing. So we're just going to keep running this way and keep pushing it. Yeah. There's a couple of really good comments come in. Will uh, okay. I don't know if you can see the one from Lieutenant Colonel brothers. He says, no, you're conducting nonlinear optimization modeling with hundreds of variables. Any number now is pure guess. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, it, it would be nice if there was a neat <laughs> equation we could plug all these variables into, but I, I was afraid there probably wasn't. Matt also, uh, can you read that, Will? Um, let's see here. Are you don't talking about the... Uh, yeah, Matt the rolling Mark? blackouts. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't see that one in here. Maybe yeah. it hasn't popped up for me yet. What do, you, what do you say? It's on the screen. Matt says, don't forget about oh. the rolling blackouts happening all over China due to their energy crisis. And that that is on our, our list, Matt. Good call. Yeah. And Alan says uh, the other problem is dock workers and unions that mm -hmm. mandate who handles certain jobs in the chaos that involves like it or not. Here's another one. Uh, you know, we were in Beaufort, South Carolina recently. And one of the things that we learned is Beaufort has one of the deepest uh, ports in the entire seaboard. So it's mm -hmm. not like you can just, I'll just build another one. No, you yeah. have to have a natural deep water port to yeah. unload this stuff. And if you don't have one, it's not like, well, we just build one right up the road from LA. Yeah. If it's not deep water, you're, you're wasting your time. Yep. Hey, uh, Jesse brought up a, a point here uh, with the nationwide staffing issue. Do you think the government will issue more work visas to try and fill all the empty spots, try to get everything back in order? Uh, the UK started doing this. They started fast tracking visas for uh, people who can drive trucks. Uh, so we, we could well see that. Um, you yeah, know, we could. 
I, yeah, I tell I you, on the, I just bought plantation shutters for our home. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the salesman that came in, this has been several months ago, Will. He says, mm -hmm. I can get them for you made in America and they'll be here on time, but it's going to be uh, three times the price. Let's say I paid 5000 I don't remember what it was. but So it'll be 15000 made in America and I can have them to you here in two months or, you, or, or a month. Or you can wait three months mm -hmm. and have them made in China at the $5,000 mark. And I'm like, why is it going to take so long? It's, oh, they'll, they'll be made in the, in the less than a week. It's getting them here. And that's the first time I really realized how bad the problem is. Because now we're working on a way to bring them in through Mexico, mm -hmm. put them in, a, in a, a truck, and then drive them north using whatever NAFTA or whatever's going mm -hmm. on there. Yep. But anyway, I mean, pe people are desperately trying to get the work around for this. Yeah. Now, you reminded me of a, a, a story. I, I used to play a lot of golf. And I was talking to a Callaway rep one time. And somehow supply chain came up. He, he was, this would have been uh, 15, 16 years ago. And he was saying that they would, the, the head covers for the, the woods, they mm -hmm. would um, sew them in Mexico, ship them to China for the embroidery, ship them back to Mexico to finish the sewing, and then truck them into the U.S. And that was cheaper than making them in the U.S. at the time. And that's how we wound up in this this witch's brew. When that when that stuff is cheaper, I mean, when companies are looking at the bottom line, and that's what they're in business for, right? They're they're going to flow to that that cheapest source. Yeah, and just as longshoremen take a long time to get certified to be qualified to operate lifts, etc., and Adam is joining us from Jonesboro, Georgia. Thank you to the twenty three folks that are joining Will and I this morning. So I know about labor shortages. You touched on that. We talk yep. about tr truck shortages, but what else is yep. going on? Well. Um, it, it, this plays back into your your talk last week about the microchips. Uh, currently, between uh, Freightliner, Volvo, and Mac, uh, of those three, they've got about 13,000. They call them red tag trucks. Trucks that are complete except for some parts. And those trucks are just sitting in fields that they're renting and uh, parking lots waiting on these parts, which are stuck in the supply chain. So you need more trucks to solve the supply chain issue, but the parts to finish the trucks are stuck in the supply chain. Oh my gosh. The, the difference between fiction and reality is fiction has to make sense, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> it's, 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 it, if it wasn't so serious, it'd be laughable. Yeah. So it, it, it's a, it's just a circular problem. Mm -hmm. The things we need to fix our supply chain are preventing us from fixing the supply chain. Yeah. It, it was like arguing with me when I was a teenager, just forget about it. Just move on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now it's gone. This, this, the shipping thing's gone so bad that uh, Walmart and Target are actually chartering their own ships, their own container ships, and they can throw the bucks at it. Now, as a small business owner, I don't compete with either one of those, but as a small business owner, how do you compete with that? You know, when they're, when they're willing to throw whatever it takes to get that ship to cut the line at, at Long Beach and go straight to a dock and unload. But the small business owner's stuff is stuck on, you know, one container out there somewhere. Next thing you know, the small business has empty shelves and Walmart has stock. Yeah. And you're done. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely smoked. Yep. So, so we talked, we talked about the, why can't they just, you know, go to the Panama Canal and mm -hmm. take the stuff into New York where they do have some room. But of course, mm -hmm. there's lots of problems with that. Um, any, any other issues involved with the pan, using potentially using the Panama canal? Yeah. Are you familiar with Panamax ships that term? Are you no, familiar I never. With that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that those are ships that are built exactly to fit through the locks in the Panama canal. And I remember watching a, a documentary on that and it would, I mean, literally you're talking inches on each side of the ship, which is to me is mind boggling to, to, to do that. But that, that you're limited by that. So a Panamax container ship can haul about 5,100 containers. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. That's, that's a lot of containers. You Sounds know, like a lot. Is, yeah. Uh, well, the uh, ULCV, I think we're going to start getting familiar with that acronym. It's Ultra Large Container Vessels. Um, they're 1,200 feet long. Now, bear in mind, the max for the canal is about 600 feet. So they're twice as long. They're also way too wide. But that one can carry... 14,500 containers. Jeez. So when your, your supply chain is counting on that kind of volume and all of a sudden you're running 
5,000 containers and it takes longer, that's not going to, in the end, that's not going to help solve the problem. And you still have this, whatever time it takes to sail from long, you know, being stuck in Long Beach and then coming all the way down through the Panama Canal and then back up to New York City. And then the stuff's in the wrong place. And I, I'm reading something in your notes about the Maersk Triple E class. What's that? Yeah, that one, uh, that's the that ultra large um, uh, container vessel. With the current rates, that one carries 18,270 containers. Okay. I mean, it's just mind boggling to me. I, I can't even envision. I, I need to go see one of these things and, and, and wrap my brain around that. But at the current rates, they're billing a total of $365 million for one crossing from China to the U.S. So a third of a billion dollars on one yep. ship. Yep. So, I mean, and the rate these container prices are going up there, that's going to that's gonna become even more. And that's why they're leaving containers, leaving goods sitting on rail cars on the West Coast and leaving with empty containers. And what about if some of, you know, we haven't discussed this, but some of those products that are sitting on container ships, I'm sure are perishable. Well, I would think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's such a witch's brew. I, I I don't even know where to begin on on how do you prioritize that? How do you? I don't either. You, and Alan talks about something that you briefly mentioned too, Will, and he says there is a Volvo assembly plant north of my home, about ninety miles. They have unfinished trucks sitting on the property, and now rumors about assembly line shutdown. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a great point. It's like what you said. You know, we got fields of trucks i mean at what point do you have to shut down the assembly line it's like look guys i've got all the trucks i can build i'm gonna have to lay mm -hmm. off all these workers i have nothing for you to assemble here right yeah so we get the parts and then what does that do to our economy yeah. what is that i mean and then here comes more stimulus to pay these people right and then what's that do to our 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 dollar what's that do to the value of the dollar i well, again, like we're going to talk about next week inflation and inflation mm -hmm. is simply when you have too many dollars chasing too few goods. Does that sound mm -hmm. like what we have right now? Uh, yeah. A sure lot, does. Of, lot of dollars washing around, but we can't get the stuff into to purchase it. So we got yeah. too few goods. Yep. Anyway, so I, I ordered wheelbarrows yesterday, so they're not stuck in the supply chain when I need a wheelbarrow to carry all my money around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, so you, I know we we probably touched on it a second ago. Somebody, one of our viewers yeah. brought it up. Ch China is struggling with the, their electricity right now. Can you tell us about yep. that? And that's because of the supply chain. They're, they're not able to, uh, both them and, and Germany uh, had to shut down power plants because they couldn't get coal to them. So, you know, and then, you, you know, the cascading effects of that, we, we know what a blackout will do for a few days. And this one, you know, they're doing rolling, basically rolling blackouts, brownouts in China now. Um, and then we go back to our discussion on Evergrande, uh, which is still out there. Uh, maybe we can touch on that at the end because I do have a little bit of new information on that. Yeah. But absolutely. there's, um, you know, that's going to start creating social unrest. Winter's coming in China, um, as it is here in the States, of course. But, you know, you got to have electricity to heat those homes. That's what I was just thinking, you know, it, it, what, what does the decision uh, matrix look like if you're in China? I give, I give uh, the coal for people to heat their homes or do I take that coal to, to mm -hmm. keep our manufacturing plants going? Yep. And that's, and then that, if those, they've already, um, apparently making concrete is very electricity intensive. Um, they're already shutting down or, or throttling way back those concrete plants, which of course then is going to affect the housing market in China, which rolls back to our Evergrande discussion and social unrest over there. Um, and then that, if they, if it rolls into other factories, well, now our supply chain is further impacted because the stuff isn't getting made. Never mind getting on a ship. Yeah. The social unrest part is an interesting one. You know, I, I, over the week, over the weekend, American news media, for whatever reason, are not covering what's going mm -hmm. on in, in uh, Australia, France and mm -hmm. other places with the people are tired of the COVID lockdowns and, yep. and, and the vaccine passports and all this other foolishness. So keep an eye on that, folks. You're going to have to go outside the mainstream media here in America to see anything about it. I'm afraid mm -hmm. but it, it is going on now. You've already got this unrest that's starting to simmer, and then you add on top of it an inability to get the goods and services that we're used to, et cetera. Yep. Yep. It's, 
it, it's going to be a mess. I mean, I, I really think we're at the the very start of it right now. It's like you say, people, the shrink, shrinkflation that's going on, people don't, it's not as noticeable. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, it's not, no, it's, it's not as noticeable at all. You really got to look hard. I was looking at like a, a little Debbie cake or something somebody bought in here. And the, mm -hmm. the size of the little cake has gotten tiny. I mean, yeah. they're it's, not much bigger than a silver yeah. dollar now. It's, it's tiny Debbie now. Yeah. So, um, Alan brings up a good point here. You got plenty of coal in, in Southwest Virginia. Uh, but former presidential administrations, I'll be politically correct, uh, have shuttered that industry. We, we are, the United States is the Saudi Arabia of coal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Bill Clinton way back in the day made a deal with China to send a bunch of coal uh, to China instead of using it here in the States. Um, so there was a, a, the, you know, messing around with the supply chain stuff is not a new thing. No, and I'm reading in the notes here, uh, Will, it says the same factories are being hit by energy price increases just like we are here in the U.S. So this means price of goods will continue to climb. Mm -hmm. So price of goods are going to climb for a variety of reasons, one of which could be scarcity, another mm -hmm. could be due to energy prices. So yep. we're a double whammy. Yep, and, and unfortunately, I think all this stuff is going to start hitting about the same time, and a whole lot of people are going to go, what, what's going on? What happened to my cheap Chinese goods? Not so cheap anymore. Yep. And, and, and let's talk about that. You know, we, we touched on it briefly at the beginning of the show. You've got container ships waiting weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm -hmm. They have to get they, they have to have fuel to keep the ships running. They have to have uh, fuel to keep the ships running, food to feed mm -hmm. the crews, wages for the crews. But if the crew's sitting on that ship twiddling their thumbs for four weeks playing Xbox, mm -hmm. they're not they're <laughs> not moving more goods. Right. Yeah. How, how would it go if you left a bunch of Marines back when you were a young man sitting off there for a month? How long before you guys would have problems there? Oh, yeah. People be swimming ashore, buddy. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, these, these ship workers here, um, some of them haven't been home in 18 months since all this started. Because of all the COVID restrictions, they can't get off the ship anywhere. Uh, over in, in uh, China, if one person on the ship has COVID, the ship can't dock. Even though there's no, I'm assuming there's very little where they could I uh, interpersonal uh, contact there. Uh, so now that I mean, that ship could go sit somewhere for months. I mean, let's just assume a crew of forty. I don't actually know how many. Let's just assume a crew of forty. You, as COVID moves through there, that clock restarts each time somebody tests positive again. So it, that that ship's just idled for the entire time, further complicate, complicating the entire supply chain. Yeah, and I was looking at um, this idea that, oh, my God, one person on the ship has COVID. You know, the world's stopping. Mm -hmm. We'll take that $365 million worth of goods and just push it back to the, to the end. It's just insane. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was reading something about the president of New Zealand, you know, uh, and she was actually tripped up and said it on, on uh, national television that, that they're working hard on their propaganda. She actually used <laughs> the word. And the, 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 the saying deadly Delta, deadly Delta, deadly Delta, that the Delta variant is so deadly. And somebody actually looked and there's been one person, one person die of the Delta variant in all of the country, New Zealand. And it was an 80 something year old woman with a host of comorbidities. Yeah. And for that, we're going to shut the entire country down in New Zealand. Or for that, we're going to keep an, a container ship full of things that we need to keep the economy running. And again, people think, Keep the economy running, Rich. You're talking about toilet paper or a, a bicycle or something silly. I'm like, no, guys, think of the medical equipment. You know, we've got at mm -hmm. least two physicians on this morning that are talking about not being able to get IVs and, and things of that nature. So, and is is that is that really that important? And like you you already mentioned it, Will. We're not talking about interpersonal spaces that these people have to operate mm -hmm. in. We're talking about pick a container up, set a container on a truck, lash it down, and drive away. I mean, let me let me firmly affix my tinfoil hat here. It's almost like it's almost like somebody wants some things to fall apart, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I hate to put the tinfoil hat on, but I think that whoever wants it to fall apart, be careful what you wish for, because mm -hmm. uh, like Lieutenant Colonel Brother says, we are waiting on a systematic failure, you know, a cascading set of failures here. Yep. And yep. Uh, we we may be seeing the beginnings of it right now. Well, and one thing I've I've learned uh, over the years and in, in studying investments is. These things don't happen in a linear fashion. 
they, they, they go exponential. And once they go exponential, just like with all the COVID stuff in the beginning, I mean, you and I were talking about it early on, but once it started, it wasn't a, it, it was not a, a linear movement. It went exponential. Yeah. And, and the exponential thing is, is an interesting one. It's hard to, hard to wrap your mind around once you start getting into exponential functions and mathematics, but maybe we'll talk about it before the end of the show. Cause it's, it's pretty startling when you really mm -hmm. consider it. Yep. Um, so go ahead. Where were we, sir? So China uh, won't allow these things to dock if they got right. personal COVID. Go ahead, sir. So, yeah. So now, now you've got these, these, uh, you know, merchant Marines out there, you know, they're, they're sending Los Angeles for four weeks, turn around, go back. Somehow somebody gets COVID and now they're sitting for however long, possibly weeks until everybody on the ship tests negative. Uh, it, it just, it's just going to continue to spiral. I don't see, you mean, you, you park two, three, five ships, pick your number, and there's hundreds of them out there, but you don't have to park very many to make it very difficult to catch up on this when there's no excess capacity to begin with. Yeah, and Rex says, oh, there are plenty who would want to see the U.S. fail and fall apart, and it would fail from the inside. Very sad. Mm -hmm. Alan okay. says, my favorite saying for all of this is one big catch-22 cluster with no real end in sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I don't see an end anytime soon. So, you know, um, it, it, we, we were talking about Germany with their cool stuff. Lebanon just shut down all of their electrical power plants because of lack of fuel. Oof. They're in the Middle East. I'm pretty sure there's lots of fuel there. Yeah, and I just saw that. I think uh, California just shuttered its last nuclear reactor or something like that. I'm like, guys, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the way for why are we not? I, again, I go back to I think one of our greatest failures was on September the 12th, 2001. On that day, we should have saw like, hey, man, we need to become energy independent so that we can you know, we can tell the Middle East to, to pound sand and we never have to worry about them again. Nobody's going to be flying planes into our buildings. Let's let's take care of these problems in house. And and we didn't it seemed like we went full bore on the globalization model. And it's like, wow. OK, yep. Good, good luck. Yep. And and, you know, those those chickens are coming home to roost. So. Um, so the last thing I want to touch on you know, this is all great stuff to talk about. What's it, what's it mean? What, what do I think it means for us, you know, as, as warriors, as people who want to protect our families, right? Um, this is very important, Rich, for Miss Lisa, start your Christmas shopping early. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, 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 it's one thing to not have toilet paper, but if you miss that Christmas present, you're in, you're in deep caca there, brother. That's right. And so now when I say start early, I'm not talking to start December 20th instead of the 23rd. Like we all do guys. We, okay. I'm with you. Um, start, start now. Cause if, especially if it's a big ticket item, like Rex here brought up, uh, he's looking to get some furniture and they're talking three months to get it. Uh, I'm not suggesting you, you, you buy your bride furniture for Christmas. Okay. But the, the, it's going to continue to, to cascade that timeline. So, yeah, just get on it now, guys. Um, well, and another thing, like Rasmus says, getting ready to attend Mike's defensive close quarters uh, class. So, again, mm -hmm. from a defensive standpoint, maybe it's time to take that class you've been putting off because your yep. your dollars can't get necessarily go into goods right now, but you can certainly go into training and definitely want to get ammunition and get your body ready. You know, we talk yeah. about this all the time, but it's it's going to be you that goes through the disaster not some piece of kit so exactly what else it's, does it mean for our daily lives i mean we touched on a few things well we we well, rex brought up the furniture thing which i had not seen that timeline some appliances are running over 18 months right now um and i can this has been a year ago now i did i had a dishwasher blow up here in the house and dump water all over the place and i was able to find one in stock at a smaller um store and, and buy it right off the floor. Otherwise I was going to be looking at two months and that was a year ago. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it, it's, it's cascading. It's getting worse. I, I keep using that word cascading because I can't come up with something else. It, it it's going to flow through to everything. And I, and uh, as you brought up, there's microchips and everything. So is that yeah. what's holding up these appliances? I'm really not sure. Um, could be they're sitting on a ship somewhere coming from China. 
Yeah, just as the throwaway mentality is done, people need to learn how to repair what they have and not just mm -hmm. keep buying and replacing broken items. Yeah. Yep. Tony says, if anyone is wondering what to get me for Christmas, batteries and solar panels. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way he's thinking. Yeah, me too. Do, do for yourself, because if those uh, same supply chains hit our power plants, uh, it's going to be looking pretty smart. Yeah. So uh, the last thing, and I'm just starting to see a few articles on this right now out there, Rich. Uh, diapers. There, mm. there are some places are starting to report shortages in diapers. Um, so if you got little, little ones, um, might be time to get ahead of that curve. Cause you know, we saw what people were fighting, how badly people were fighting over paper towels and toilet paper. Imagine when it's your, your child, we're, we're, we're going to see some real, some real fights there in the Walmart aisle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any anything else before we close out today's show? No, I was just going to touch back on that Evergrande that we talked about. Um, Please, yeah. The just real quick, the uh, they missed. The, they have, they have two types of bonds, domestic and international. So domestic is uh, our Chinese citizens that own the bonds. The reports are those bonds. The interest payment was made. Uh, now that's reported in their state controlled media. We really don't know if it was truly made or not. Uh, we do, however, know for a fact they did not pay any of the international bonds, which are denominated in U.S. dollars. We know that for a fact. Um, now, they're not technically in default until the 25th of October. because Those, those bonds, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the 23rd. Those are bonds that are supposed to be paid on September 23rd, and they're not technically in default until 30 days after that. Uh, but we do know they are continuing to sell properties to raise funds. And, of course, that's never a good sign for a business. No, no, it's never a good sign for business. Um, yep. Anything else? We've kept folks on here for almost an hour, man. Uh, like we said, uh, Will and I, next Monday, we're going to discuss. Oh, no, you know what? We can't because yeah. I will be in New Jersey. Yep. Let's see. So it'll be the 25th then? Yeah, yeah, it'll be the 25th and we'll do uh, interest rates. Uh, Alan says, sad part is ammo was just beginning to drop a little bit in some and somewhat become more available. Dave says to add to the positivity if Taiwan kicks off all military should expect recall going back five years, a total of reserve call-ups. Hmm. And that of course would mean that you, sir, Dave may not get to retire. Like you think you're going to in December. Yeah. And, uh, and again, well, another thing is, does the U S have to respond? Uh, I read a really interesting article it says that the, the U S might be better off leading an international coalition and doing some sort of blockade and, you know, having the UN kind of shoulder the responsibility because we're in no position to fight China. And I'm like, well, if that's the case, uh, you know, are you willing to give up 60 plus percent of all the semiconductors? We already have a problem mm -hmm. already. Are you willing to, to part ways with all those semiconductors? Again, that's the new oil folks. Yep. Uh, to become, people are going to get real good at working on uh, carburetors and uh, timing and points, right? Yeah, I mean, look at Havana. You know, they they did a. Mm -hmm. You can go down there and get a nice 1957 Chevy. Uh huh. Sure can. There's a reason. There's a reason for that. Uh, any anything else, Will? No, that's all I got, brother. All right, folks. Thank you for being on this morning's edition of Emerging Threats Monday with Will and I here on Coffee with Rich. Please uh, hope you share this conduct content with others who need it, because I think a lot of Americans are not paying attention to this stuff and they really need to. And until next time, folks, remember the fight is coming. Be ready.